In late 2015, I came up with an idea for a game that wouldn't be released until mid-2023. That game was called Disharmony, and it was a rhythm game RPG. It was... fine. There were a lot of really cool moments, uh, the music was really good, there was neat puzzles, the battle system was pretty well thought out, which led some pretty satisfying gameplay. That said, the story had pacing issues, the difficulty was very high for the average person, and the graphics were pretty rubbish. So, how about we make something better? Hi. The name's Dash, and after many years of planning, I'm finally ready to reveal my next big project, internally titled Project Paradox. And while that's a cool title and all, now that the game is finally ready to be revealed, I might as well refer to it by its intended name, Serenity. Serenity is, much like my previous game, a rhythm game RPG, but simply calling it a retread of what I've already done is a criminal understatement. The game is technically a sequel to Disharmony, but you don't have to play the first game to understand the story of this one. And this time, the story follows Kane, an optimistic farmer turned adventurer who, while traveling the seas, encounters Selene, a strange bow winged girl with the ability to travel through time, and a destiny tied to saving the dying world. They go on a journey together to fulfill Selene's destiny. While on their journey, they meet Dana, a noble from Isle Eclipse, Delilah, a cat girl from Mercury Island, Sophie, a blind blacksmith from Rhapsody Island, and Johnny, another time traveler who already knows the outcome of their journey. The story deals with concepts like accepting or defying one's destiny, accepting that some things are inevitable, and the moral dilemma of sacrificing something or someone in order to save something or someone else. The most obvious improvement when comparing it to my previous game is the graphics, which have been improved in just about every way. The pixel art is more detailed, uses a more consistent and pleasing color palette, and has much more overall appeal. The characters are able to fade eight directions instead of four, and their animations feel more grounded in the game's world. And as you'll have noticed by now, the game uses a partially reverse-engineered deferred lighting engine, which allows for some really striking scenes and effects. Since creating Disharmony, I've also learned a decent chunk of GLSL, or OpenGL shading language. This means I can use my own custom-made shaders and not just ones yoinked from the internet. Even if it takes a while to get right sometimes. At a later date, I will be making a dedicated video to the game's graphics, the challenges that go into making them, the choices that went into the aesthetic, but I'll get into that more later on in this video. One of Disharmony's simultaneous biggest strengths and weaknesses was its overworld gameplay. There's tons of objects to interact with, all with unique text that sometimes changes depending on when and how you interact with them, but that's sort of the extent of it. Controlling the player character felt pretty floaty, and it didn't feel like you had much impact on the world. Serenity, on the other hand, will not only include tons of dialogue and easter eggs, but the player is also able to interact with the world in other ways as well. The world is just far more lively in Serenity than it was in Disharmony. Some objects are flammable and can be set on fire. That fire can spread to other nearby objects. Some objects might be lights and can be pushed around by the player, or even the wind. These interactions are heavily inspired by Breath of the Wild's chemistry system, which I've been a massive fan of since before the game even came out. While the game is rendered in 2D, it actually makes use of the Z-axis as well, allowing objects to occupy space in a way that makes the world feel much less flat. And what better feature to go along with this new Z-axis than a jump button? The longer you charge the jump, the higher you'll go upon letting go of the button. Oh, and the player doesn't move faster when walking diagonally anymore. Ever heard of Pythagoras' theorem? Well, so would I. And I just promptly ignored it when programming the movement for Disharmony. Oops. A lot of the town layouts in Disharmony felt a bit too large and oftentimes somewhat aimless. It was hard to tell where exactly you should and shouldn't go. For the different areas in Serenity, I've made sure to design them so that every route leads to a point of interest effectively nullifying the risk of making players wonder where they're supposed to go, while still giving them multiple options if they don't immediately want to reach their objective. Since it's a game about music, you're able to play songs in the overworld, in a way similar to Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. There's plenty more overworld mechanics in the works. Um, some might get scrapped, others might not. Either way, I'll talk more about them in the future. One of the biggest problems with the Disharmony story was that the characters didn't get enough screen time to match the ambition of the plot. This time, the characters get much more screen time, and a lot of scenes only exist to further develop their backstories and relationships. The plot is also very multi-layered this time around. Disharmony's plot was as well, but you had to dig in pretty deep to find the different layers and how they're connected. In Serenity, the connection between the different layers is a lot more evident, and should result in a more cohesive story, and I'm almost certain I've managed to make sure it doesn't feel dumbed down in any way. The code base for the game is not only significantly cleaner and easier to understand than Disharmony's, it's also written in a much less limiting way. As an example, had Disharmony had multiple party members, I would almost certainly have hard-coded them into each scene. This time around, I can add whichever character I want in whichever potential spot I want. Do you want Selene to be in the front of the party instead of Kane? Sure, why not? Want a party of nine Kanes? Sure, Buckaroo, here you go. Well, do you want a party with zero characters? 
why the hell not? A change like that takes seconds to make and doesn't ruin any system in the game. You know how I handled the character animations in Disharmony? Not, well, that's for sure. In Serenity, they're handled by a state machine. Sure, it took a while to set up, but now that it's done, animations are basically handled automatically. While I'm far, far from an expert, I now have a basic understanding of trigonometry, which I didn't have during Disharmony's development. This means that something like moving an object up and down can be done with a simple sign function instead of manually programming an object to accelerate up and down based on the coordinates and states and what have you. While a lot of it has yet to be written, I have plans for the music to be much more dynamic than the music in Disharmony was, but I'll talk about that more in detail at a later time. One thing I can say about the music is that a lot of it uses real instruments and not just samples. That isn't the case for every song, not even close. But I feel like using real instruments makes it feel a little more personal, and a little less generic since it's a unique sound that can't be replicated instead of a sound snippet that millions of people have access to. Okay, so there's still a pretty big elephant in the room, metaphorically at least. I still haven't said anything about the game's new battle system. That's mainly because it's so pretty early in development, so you'll have to excuse the extremely basic visuals, and if maybe some of the mechanics I'm describing aren't lining up exactly with what you're seeing on the screen, since I'm still figuring out how some things are working from a coding perspective. The battle system is, in a way, right now, in a state where it's almost complete, yet uh, barely resembles the final product at the same time. The logic is sound, and the mechanics are mostly in place? but I have yet to finalize which menus do exactly what, and some stats haven't been implemented, and so on and so forth. A lot of visual indicators are missing as well, and it's just kind of confusing to watch when you don't know what's happening. One thing you'll understand if you watch the final devlog of Disharmony is that I spent a lot of time in care creating a system that would make it easy to chart songs. That's because the last time I did it was a fucking disaster. If you haven't seen my videos about Disharmony, I had to hard code each note into a timeline frame by frame by calculating the amount of time between each and every note of a song. It worked. The average player would never be able to tell how this was pulled off. However, this meant that charting a single short song could take hours to do, and I'm not planning on falling into that same trap again. This time around, I'm using a lightweight system where charts are made using a 2D array representing a bar of music as well as a note from 1 to 16. Or 0 to 15, but as a lot of you probably know, in programming, numbered sequences start at 0. A timer then counts down at a speed based on the song's tempo, and runs a custom function that goes through the chart and creates whichever note is stored at its current position in the array. This is easily tweakable and has reduced the average charting time for a song from several hours to, like, 20 minutes or so. It's also all controllable from a single game object, which means I don't need to keep track of a hundred different timelines for a single song to work. Game Maker, my engine of choice, is going to be receiving official FMOD support soon. In short, FMOD is an audio engine used by tons of games, which um, basically allows them to dynamically change the way sounds are played at runtime. I plan on using FMOD for a wide variety of things in my game, which again I will get into at a later date. One thing I can get into right now is that I may be able to create an even more streamlined system further down the line if that ends up being necessary, making use of FMOD's features, obviously. Generally speaking, I would like to waste as little time as possible remaking features that already work, but if what I have in mind is possible, it might actually be worth it, but we'll, we'll see about that when we get to it. One other FMOD related feature I've planned is that the player will be able to customize the sound of their instrument by equipping things like guitar pedals. Making use of FMOD, I'd be able to give the player the ability to add effects like reverb, chorus, or distortion to your guitar without me having to record, edit, and export a unique track for each variant, as it would all be handled more or less automatically under the hood. Looking past all the audio related shenanigans though, the battle system is effectively an expanded version of the one in Disharmony. Enemies attack by using various riffs and rhythms, and the player can counter them by playing along. The player attacks the enemy by playing along to the background music. Getting an enemy's health below zero will give you bonus XP, and maintaining high combos or encounters will give you SP which you can spend to play solos with basically spells. However, since you have more than one party member this time around, a lot of mechanics have to be added and changed. Much like with Disharmony, Serenity won't be making use of RNG for its gameplay. So then, how is stuff like turn order decided? Well, each character now has aggro, which is generated by different actions. Different actions generate different amounts of aggro, and whichever character has the most aggro will be targeted by the enemies. Also, to prevent battles from turning into a repetitive slog, only one character can attack the enemy per turn. The other characters can spend their turn dealing buffs and debuffs to the enemies and party members. This isn't entirely unlike World of Horror's battle system where you select several actions at once that all get executed once you select launch. Also, each character has their own instruments. 
each coming with their own unique playstyle. I played around a little bit with this concept and disharmony, but it was only applicable for certain enemies in certain scenarios, and not a constant for every character, since you can only ever control one character at a time. Now, that all sounds swell and stuff, but I'm sure you have lots of questions. First of all, if your first impression of anything I've ever made is a game that looks like this, that took forever to make, then you may question my ability to be able to make a game at this scale at all, which is fair. However, while Serenity is a lot more ambitious than does Harmony, maybe a little bit too ambitious for its own good, I have gotten one hell of a lot better at making games over the years. While this is hard to showcase for Serenity since the game is nowhere near to being done, I can show you this. This is a drawing I made around the time of Disharmony's conceptualization. It isn't very good. The colors are flat and oversaturated, the line art is wonky and the proportions are whack. This isn't the only example, as I made a lot of drawings around the same time. I came up with Disharmony's concept on December 8th, 2015, and I started drawing on October 25th, 2015. In contrast to that, here is a drawing I made at the start of last year, around the time I started prototyping Serenity. In comparison to the other drawing, it's quite good. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and claim that I'm some sort of ultra-talented artist and I'm absolutely incredible and oh well, look at me, I'm awesome. The point I'm trying to make here is simply that you get better at doing things over time. Not just at drawing, but at making games as well. Man, it sounds like practicing something makes you better. Another thing I'd like to talk about is a comment I got on the final devlog for Disharmony. A comment which a lot of people seem to agree with, myself included, but I am directly contradicting it by working on this game. That comment suggested making a less ambitious game for my next project. That way I wouldn't have to risk wasting years and years of my life developing a game that no one would actually end up playing. I absolutely think this is sound advice and makes complete sense, but I'm doing the exact opposite by developing a more ambitious game. <laughs> Part of the reason for this is that Serenity was already kind of in development at that point, I've been planning features for this game for years and years and years, and I wanted to work on it instead of Disharmony for about half of that game's development. But more importantly than that, I don't really make games with the expectation of making a profit. I make them out of passion and creativity. <laughs> I would hate to force myself to work on something else just because it was more profitable. I feel like the whole point would just be lost. Now that's not to say I'll never like pause development and go work on something smaller for a bit at any point throughout the next few years while I'm developing Serenity, I'm just not planning on it. And also, I'm not planning on letting this one fail. I learned a lot throughout Disharmony's development, more than any other thing in life has taught me. I know of its strengths and flaws in ways much deeper than any player would. I know which parts of its development went well and which ones didn't. I learned to deal with scenarios most people will never run into. I ran a crowdfunding campaign, I signed my first NDA, I got to work with voice actors, and I got to lead what was kind of a pretty large project. Aside from the knowledge and experience I've gained while working on Disharmony, I also graduated from Future Games, where I studied as a game designer for two years. During my time there, not only did I get to work with a variety of very talented people and work on interesting projects I wouldn't have gotten to touch otherwise, I also learned things from people whose titles range from industry veteran to indie developer. It's because of that knowledge and experience I've gained that I'm confident in saying that I'm not going to let this project fail again. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not aiming for this to be the next Minecraft, that's not my goal. I'm just saying that I'm confident that I won't be making another huge financial failure of a game. <laughs> Starting from this point onwards, a lot of things in this channel are going to change. I will still be making devlogs, but the way they are presented is going to be quite different. Instead of having a long checklist of things I've been working on for the past weeks or months, each video is going to be on a dedicated subject, whether it be a challenge I've overcome or a deep dive into a specific feature of the game. For example, the first video to be released after this one is going to be a deep dive into the game's graphical style and how it's achieved on a technical level. Along with these new devlogs, I'm also going to be doing something I hope a lot of people can learn from. I've made a lot of mistakes as a game dev over the past eight years, and through those mistakes I've also learned a lot of lessons. And while it's great that I've learned from those mistakes, I think it would be better if other people could as well. I will be making videos dedicated to the mistakes I've made throughout the years, problems that they've caused, and how I solved them, so that any other aspiring game devs watching can avoid making the same ones. I might also throw in the occasional opinion piece or analysis of things in other games, anything where I feel like I have something to say that others can potentially learn from. To be completely honest with you for a second, I've never felt super comfortable making videos like this. 
being a public figure is really scary. You never know how someone's going to interpret something you've said or how they'll judge you. If I had the ability to do so, I would much rather probably have just been some mysterious force working in the shadows, never seen in public. But in today's oversaturated indie scene, making videos like these seem to be the only hope for devs like myself who wish to stick out from the crowd. That of course means I and everyone else has to rely on the wonderful entity that is the YouTube algorithm, which up until recently has not been very kind to me. <laughs> However, if the videos I make can genuinely teach people how to avoid mistakes I've made in the past, if they can save them from going through the same trouble I did, maybe it's worth it. Let's address a few more things before wrapping up. First of all, I just want to mention that Serenity will not be making use of artificial intelligence for its art, text, code, audio, or any other component. The point is to make something original, not a computer's approximation of other people's work. Second of all, the game currently has no budget. I don't plan on bringing it to Kickstarter or any of its competitors, but I've tossed the idea of opening a Patreon around, and I'll be making my final decision regarding that based on feedback from viewers like yourself in the near future. And finally, there are still a lot of challenges ahead for this project. I have the know-how on how to do most things on a technical level, but I will still be needing help with a lot of aspects of the game's development. For example, something you may have noticed from my previous drawing examples, I'm a character artist, not an environmental artist, which is why things like cliff sides are missing from the town you've been seeing in the background of this video. I also know very little about architecture, which is why a lot of the buildings look extremely generic. It would also save me a lot of time if I could get someone to help me with the creation of normal maps, since those take a lot of time to make and are necessary for the game's lighting system to work. Now, all of King's normal maps weren't even finished in time for this video. I'm sure more examples will pop up in the future. In case anyone's interested in helping out with such features in the future, feel free to reach out at bootcatstudio at gmail.com. Since I don't currently have a budget, I'm not able to provide financial compensation at this time. That's not to say I expect anyone to work for free. Anyone who helps with the creation of the game deserves to be compensated for it. But getting in touch, showing interest is a good first step. And that's kind of it for now. If you want to see how the game develops in the future, then you're free to come along for the ride. You know what to do. I don't need to tell you. If any specific aspect of the game piqued your interest throughout this video, and you'd like to know more about it, then feel free to tell me so, and I might make a dedicated video on it. I plan on showcasing this game a lot, and my goal is to be as transparent as possible, so don't hesitate to ask for specifics. The only things I will actively be keeping secrets are details of the game's plot and also late-game elements. A massive, massive thank you goes out to everyone watching and for your continued support. And as I always say at the end of my videos, have a good day.